1779 to 1783, shortly after the loss of the Amerinis, the garrison and townspeople of Gibraltar endured a siege by combined forces of Spain and France that was so lengthy, violent and traumatic that it has gone down in history as the Great Siege. During these dark times, the ingenuity and wit of both the garrison and the attackers was severely tested, with many new inventions and feats of engineering being accomplished on both sides. Numerous feats of military skill and daring took place. One such event was the Great Sortie of 1781. Diary of Private John Gordon, 73rd Regiment, November 26th, in the year of our Lord, 1781. There are rumours that our Governor General Elliot has spent several days interrogating a pair of deserters from the other side, but if this is the case, they are being kept safely locked up in the convent. This is probably wise, as only four days ago, another soldier from the 58th, I think, deserted the garrison. It is true that our living conditions are deplorable. The food is a little better than slop, and many of us are dying from disease. Some unfortunate wretches cannot bear this and have turned to suicide. Yet the garrison, in the main, is sound in spirit. Many diseases such as scurvy, caused by the lack of vitamin C, and spotted fever were rife. Lack of fresh provisions meant that the price of food rocketed. Gibraltar's damp climate didn't help either and the salt meat in the stores rapidly rotted. Potatoes were selling at one shilling and eight pence a pound. A pound of onions cost two shillings nine and a quarter pence, or a pound of sugar for 17 shillings. By the following year, things had got so bad that $80 were given for a sheep, bought for only four shillings at Portsmouth. I myself have just returned from duty at the Grand Battery. The evening gun has now fired. The gates are shut and thankfully, it seems, I have lived to see another day. I must say that these Spanish dawns are getting even closer to the north front. With the garrison down to firing only 50 to 100 shots a day, the enemy is getting bolder. Only yesterday Tom Williams told me how he could see the whites of their eyes from his position at Landport Guard. Long range shots from the mill battery in the middle of the isthmus now reach as far as South Barracks. Yet something is afoot. This new boldness of the enemy is breeding contempt. I hear that some officers have been out as far as the Devil's Tower. What is that the dawn's approaches are poorly constructed and that the lines are not flanked by anything? We have not heard anything as of yet, but many of us were surprised to find all the wine shops shut tonight. There's a tension in the air. Private Gordon was indeed correct. Although there was no room for thoughts of surrender, severe rationing, sickness and shelling were reducing the garrison inexorably. They had held out against starvation and bombardment for two years, but the fortress was in dire need of a respite from the enemy's attentions. Sir George Augustus Elliot, the governor of Gibraltar, was well aware of this and conceived upon a plan to carry out a sortie a guerrilla raid out into the Spanish advances and cause as much damage as possible, which would serve not only to set back the enemy's plans on Gibraltar, but also to boost the morale of his men. Given the incidents of desertion, secrecy was absolutely essential to the success of the operation. There is great excitement, yet no one was sure what was happening. As I passed the picket room, a chap from the Royal Artillery bade me adieu. Being surprised at the strangeness of such an address, I asked him in haste what he meant. He told me, you are going to burn the mill battery. I stopped to read the posted orders for the evening, and being one of the few who could read, I was asked to convey the information to the others. Evening garrison orders. Countersign, steady, all the grenadiers and light infantry of the garrison, and those of you... The orders mobilized the garrison into a frenzy of activity. Two regiments, the best companies from all the others, a strong force of artillery and Gibraltarian workmen, plus a further contribution of 100 men by Captain Curtis of the Royal Navy, were an impressive force to detach for a sortie. All were to be well armed, borrowing items from other soldiers if necessary, 
To some, it may have seemed like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. But Elliot knew it was the best way of obtaining a sure result. Over 2,000 men assembled at midnight at the Red Sands in the area known as Alameda Grand Parade. Considering there were fewer than 6,000 officers and men in the fortress, most of them undernourished, weary from continuous duties and engagements, and with little hope of outside rescue, Elliot's bold and daring idea was a tremendous risk. He was probably heartened by the information extracted from the two deserters and a captured Portuguese sailor that the main enemy forces were militia and the confirmation by his officers that the works were badly constructed and poorly guarded. Had the sortie failed, the loss of such a large number of his fit men could easily have led to the rapid fall of the garrison. Elliot was taking a major gamble with his command. We march down through Southport Street, passing the Spanish church to our right, which has taken a heavy battering, and into Waterport Street. Shell damage to the town has been extensive, and the old facade of this building will probably need to be rebuilt if this seizure ends. It was dark and slightly eerie to be out after the curfew. Everything is dark. The silence is only broken by the occasional clink of equipment, the sporadic bark of a dog, or a sentry calling. The weather for the last few days had been a gusty westerly with occasional rain. This, coupled with the ruins of the town, presented a desolate sight to the columns as they marched down towards Lamport. At a quarter to three in the morning, the soldiers moved out of Lamport through the Sally Port and across the ditch into no man's land. The forces had been organized into three columns with Brigadier General Ross in chief command. Once past the glacis, the earthen ramp that served to protect the city walls and the inundation, the leading right column marched through Forbes barrier and turned, keeping the gardens on their left. The center column followed, marching through Bayside barrier towards the mortar batteries, whilst the left column brought up the rear, marching along the narrow causeway between the open sea and the inundation, known as the Strand, towards the gun batteries. The moon, having nearly finished her nightly course, gave little light to warn the defenders of our movements. We crept forward stealthily, silence being of the essence. I was in the third column, moving directly towards our objective. Suddenly, from the east, we heard shouts and shots. Despite our best efforts, we were discovered. We quickened our pace and suddenly were over the barricades and in the enemy trenches. The time for silence was now past. The right-hand column, made up mainly of Hanoverians, had alerted some Spanish guards as they passed through Forbes' barrier. These challenged, fired and ran, with the column in pursuit. They attacked and took the parallel in front of them. At this point, a number of them lost their way and surged onto St. Carlos' battery. Here they valiantly took the battery and held it until they were mistaken for Spanish defenders and were unfortunately fired upon by the approaching center column until the countersign was called out. The columns met little resistance and as they advanced, engineers, artificers and workmen busied themselves knocking down casks, leveling sandbanks, filling in ditches and setting fire to the fascines and timber. The artillery, for its part, was busy spiking the guns. This simple operation, the driving of a metal spike into the touch hole of a gun, was sufficient to render it totally incapable of being fired ever again. Almost as rapidly as it ensued, all resistance seemed to vanish. Amongst the noise of destruction, one could hear cheers. The light of the flames allowed us to see. All around, the enemy defences were being destroyed, with the infantry formed to rebel a possible counter-attack. The sortie had been a complete success, all along the line. In the flickering light, I made out a figure of a stout officer with a sword slung over his shoulder. My word! It's the governor himself, in disguise! I stood behind him as he addressed a single wounded Spanish officer who lay on the ground. The matter was urgent, the governor explained. The magazines would be blown soon. The officer replied, No, sir, no, let me perish amid the ruins of my post. At least one Spaniard die honorably. The brave man was granted his dying wish. 
in Eliot's words. The enemy, after a scattering fire of short duration, gave way on all sides and abandoned their stupendous works with great precipitation. By a quarter to three in the morning, trains were being laid to powder magazines and these were blown. The patient work of some 14 months had been destroyed in little more than an hour and the Spanish plans for taking the rock set back significantly. All of the cost to the garrison of four men killed, 25 wounded, one missing, and surprisingly, a Scotch guard's killed. As the battery at Willis kept a stiff bombardment on the Spanish in order to prevent a counter-attack, I saw the governor look around. Look round, my boys, and view how beautiful the rock appears by the light of this glorious fire. I then stooped to pick up the Spanish officer's logbook. I could just make out what it read and called over a friend who knew a smattering of Spanish. Ha! <laughs> I heard him laugh. What does it say, I asked. It says, nothing extraordinary happened this night. <laughs> <laughs>